evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, this evening, we meet with Graham Bader to discuss his new book, Poisoned Abstraction, Kurt Schwitters Between Revolution and Exile, uh, published by Yale University Press. Graham Bader is Associate Professor and Chair of Art History at Rice University. And besides his work on Schwitters, he's written numerous essays on 20th century European and American artists including Gerhard Richter, Sigmar Polke, Thomas Truth, and Kazimir Malevich. He's also published extensively on the work of Roy Lichtenstein, who was the subject of his first book, Hall of Mirrors, with MIT Press, and uh, a 2009 issue of the October Files dedicated to Lichtenstein, which Bader edited. In conversation with Professor Bader is Yves Lambois, Professor of Art History at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton University. Professor Bois is renowned for his work on the history of modernism, and in particular, for his studies of Matisse, Picasso, Mondrian, Barnett Newman, and Ellsworth Kelly. He is the author of Painting as Model from 1990, Matisse and Picasso, 1998. He's a co-author of Art Since 1900, um, which was published in 2004. And I just have to single out my personal favorite, um, which is Formless, A User's Guide from 1997, um, of, which he's, of which he's the co-author with Rosalind Cross, which is a fantastic book and exhibition catalog, uh, tracing the influence of George Bataille, um, George Bataille's ideas on art. But back to Schwitters. Um, Poisoned Abstraction is a beautifully illustrated book um, tracing the arc of Schwitters career over three decades. We start with the first public exhibition of his collages in Berlin in 1919, with as backdrop uh, the revolutionary ferment and political chaos of Germany right after its World War I defeat. We go on to Schwitter's activities as a designer and a publisher during the Weimar era, a time of increased attention to and really fascination with the materiality of language. Uh, whether in advertising, typography, philosophy, linguistics, or indeed psychology. Um, we spend some time in the Mertzbau, the immersive interior space that Schwitters built in his Hanover studio, and which was later destroyed in a bombing raid during World War II, along with Schwitters' archive. And we end with Schwitters' years of exile uh, from 1937 to his death in 1948, as he was driven out by the Nazi regime, first to Norway, then to England, where he was interned, and finally to London. All the while, he continued making art in which, in Bader's view, the idea of exile itself becomes a decisive force. The book ends with some beautiful pages on the notion of precariousness as foundational to collage and to Schwitter's art, to his thought and to his ethics. And come to think of it, an art of precariousness born of historical turmoil is perhaps Schwitter's most enduring legacy, one without which it's difficult to imagine post-war collage, assemblage, or installation art, as it later emerges in the work of Robert Rauschenberg, Klaus Oldenburg, Bruce Connor, Ed Keenholz, or as Bader points out, Thomas Hirschhorn. At any rate, the notion certainly, the notion of precariousness certainly resonates in our own precarious historical time. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to our guests. Uh, and we may have a little time uh, for questions at the end of the conversation. So by all means, if you have any questions, please feel free to send them in to Evan via email. And the address is evan at 192books.com. Over to you, Graham and Ivela. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anthony. Thank you. Yvonne, so, you want to throw something at me? Or? Well, I want you to maybe, um, I don't know, well, maybe I'll throw something at you and you'll, you'll, you'll uh, go from there. What is, uh, as Anthony you know, quickly mentioned, what is uh, the real, really new in, in your book, and, and I learned a huge amount about it, is that um, the consideration of politics as a background, but not only the background, also as something more, more important than the background, but nevertheless, already as a background, you point out <clears throat> uh, in passing, because you don't like to throw yourself flowers, that in the literature on, on Schwitters, 
no one ever really paid attention to the fact that the invention of Mertz, what is, is founding basically as, as Schritter's, occurs exactly at the time of the, the, the very few months of the failed um, or the squandered uh, uh, German revolution of 48. So, you know, he, he starts doing his Mertz stuff as the revolution is happening and he exhibits his uh, first Mertz things just at his, at it, as it has been destroyed and in, a, in an exhibition, which is basically a few meters away where thousands of people were mass murdered by the, were killed by the police. So it's, uh, it's, you know, it's extraordinary that no one ever realized that there was this connection and you do much more than pointing to the connection. But I want to, I want to start of this, uh, with this question about, is that, is a political question something that, that was the motivation of you writing this book? Uh, thanks. That's a that's a great question. Let me just start <clears throat> by saying I don't want to say nobody's written about the 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 political sort of context in which Schwitters is working in that specific moment. People have from Dorothea Dietrich to Werner Schmalenbach. I guess what I wanted to do in that chapter specifically is to dig into the structural conditions of revolution as that ground for uh, Schwitters creation of merit. So not just an incidental thing that finds its way in, but something that really structures his thinking as he begins to think about collage aesthetics. And so to your question, if the political, uh, this idea of sort of a political Schwitters was, was motivating for me as I began to write the book, I would say yes, but not, not directly. I mean, I think that uh, for me, looking at Schwitter's work, there is, and Anthony brought this up by invoking the precarious, with, the idea of the precarious with which I end, there is um, Schwitter's work uh, in its precariousness, in its fragility, in its generation out of this moment of, hyster of historical precariousness. As I began to look at it, as I began to, to think about it in the context of, of this book, I guess what was striking to me is that this is, uh, this is a, a sort of meeting of, uh, of um, a formal precariousness of that historical condition of precariousness that again, the, the, uh, uh, seems to structurally define or sort of lay the structural ground for this work. And so entering into it through that lens of politics really sort of lends me the focus primarily of that first chapter, but then is laced throughout the book because not only was Merritt's sort of generated at that moment of, uh, of revolution in the wake of World War I, but obviously the, the historical years in which Schwitter was, was working uh, with the rise of, of the Nazis, his own move into exile. And as I sort of focus on in my final chapter, for Schwitter's already that experience of exile began before he left Germany. In 1930 already, he's described as a parasite of German culture in the right-wing press. And so, I wouldn't say again then that politics was, the idea of a political Schwitters was motivating as I began the book, but it became motivating as I sort of proceeded to work on the book. Now there's a, a fundamental concept that uh, appears very early in the book uh, uh, with regard to the kind, of the kind of ambiguity having to do in great part with politics of Schwitters' thinking which is a concept of eigengift. Yeah. So uh, basically Schwitters was accused by the Dada Berlin of being not political enough. And he himself endlessly kind of said that, I know my art is not political. I want to transform refuse in beauty and all this kind of text that we have of Schwitters. You show that he might have said that, but that was not what he was doing in his practice. I mean, in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, in his collage, he, he, when he, when, he, when he glues a little ticket, it's a real ticket. You can use it. You can, and you can call it off. You can take it off the collage if you want, and you can use it for, for your own. So he, he, he really introduced in the work of art something from the outside, which is and without transforming it necessarily into something beautiful. So you, you, this concept of eigengift, which is the, the, the poison, the self-poison, you know, which gives you, gives, uh, gives you your, your, the title of your book, is something that is very present in the first chapter about Mertz and the invention of, invention of Mertz. is present again, but it's already beginning to, 
to kind of get get a little less uh, active in the chapter on the on the typographical design of shooters. Although you would have thought that you know because he has to do with you know selling out to Das Kapital, they would have appeared more. But it's kind of it kind of disappears a bit. It completely disappears in the chapter, the third chapter on the Merzbau. And it's only at the end that it reappears when you speak about the exile, uh, exile uh, years, but then the exile years being basically against the Agen gift, against this notion of dual, the dual language, which you, you characterize as being dialectic, and I, I'm not so sure it's a dialectical, dialectical thing. It seems to me more like a Macron en même temps, you know, a little this and that, art and non art, you know. Anyway, so I would like to know more, a little more about this concept and, uh, you know, how, how you. Sure. Sure. So Eigengift, as you say, is, you know, generally it's translated uh, as a particular poison in uh, the, the English writing on Schwitters. And more literally, it would be something like own poison. Mm -hmm. uh, so an eigentor, I point out in the introduction, I think is, uh, is an own goal in soccer. Mm -hmm. uh, so one scores a goal on oneself. And so what was interesting for me in thinking about this idea of eigengift or own poison in Schwitters is as you point out, you know, Schwitters says, when I take items from outside, tickets, fabric, buttons, whatever, and put it into my work, it, that particular poison, by which he means the social sort of use and signification of those items outside the work of art, that dissipates and it becomes some sort of blissfully ideal space of, of art. That's how Schwitters talks about it. And traditionally, what people have said is, well, he's wrong. That doesn't happen at all. He doesn't understand what he's... And, the point I make, as you, as, you, as you mentioned, is that, no, he knows perfectly well what he's doing. He, he puts things in very uh, uh, pointedly that aren't sublimated and becoming pure aesthetic material, but rather their social use is front and center. And occasionally he calls on us almost to take hold or to, to, to use the items that he puts in his pictures. And that is to me where I see the dialectics of it again, that he's not, he's putting things in to his images and declaring a law sort of in line with, again, a certain sort of uh, 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 idea of modernist aesthetics, this social material now becomes aesthetic material and only aesthetic material. Mm -hmm. But all the while he's putting front and center these, these items and calling attention to the fact that they don't become aesthetic material. They remain uh, social material from the world at large. And so this, conflict, this dialectic between social material as social material, which ostensibly becomes aesthetic material, but all the while remains social material that is put forth, uh, is put before us as sort of both neither nor at the same time. And, and I describe it as a kind of staging of this conflict by Schwitters, not simply, again, a taking of social material and turn it into aesthetic material, but a staging of that conflict between again, items from the world at large that have particular meanings. And then that idea of a kind of idealizing or a sublimating within uh, the, the realm of aesthetics and art. And in the first chapter, I sort of align that with discussions within German politics at the time between sort of historical particularity and a sort of idea, an idealist idea of, uh, of subjectivity that, that people were claiming at the time, well, that's a false idea because the idea of subjectivity is produced by specific social conditions. So again, there, uh, uh, the way that Eigengift uh, functions within Schwitters becomes for me inherently political. Mm -hmm. I realize I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on that first chapter. So the, the question of the sort of longer itinerary of Eigengift throughout the book, you're right that Eigengift as such kind of fades in and out across the chapters. Um, and, I think for me, how it sort of functions as a structuring idea is really in that uh, uh, what I describe, and you know, we can we can debate about this, but this sort of dialectics at the center of Eigengift as it functions for Schwitters, mm -hmm. that this sort of idea of 
something that is both this and that, it belongs both here and there, and that those are mutually exclusive, but at the same time, mutually productive, is, is, a, is a kind of thinking that I see threaded throughout Schwitter's work. So in the second chapter, for instance, where I'm looking at his graphic design, I'm interested in Schwitter's thinking through uh, this divide between written text, between te you know, the materiality of text as sort of all, at one time, both just raw matter, but it, that, that, that moment at which raw matter in the form of, of textual substance begins to signify. Um, so again, there maybe not quite dialectical, but this question of sort of how this, this hinge point at which one thing becomes something other. I was um, thinking about something uh, else about the, 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 the chapter on, uh, on, uh, on the design, the, the second chapter. On uh, which is you know at some point you 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 almost um, uh, present Schwitter's uh, desire or 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 thought as almost a kind of um, the language of things like uh, you you know he wants to show ink as ink and um, uh, and of course it's impossible. Uh, but this desire of, show, of showing the thing as things as they are is something that returns also in the chapter on the exile uh, work, the algae as uh, as algae, the the driftwood as driftwood. But there, it's definitely uh, shown. You 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 present it as a kind of as uh, as a failure. Uh, as uh, as you, which is a, a concept I would like you to to explain a little more as a uh, thing which are not at home the the not at homeness of the of the object and and so uh, um, I mean th this is something that you don't you don't point out the the, the antagonism of those two parts those two at you know and the similarity of the the, the also this notion of the thing as such, which would yeah. be at home. And, and because it leads to a very interesting discussion of exile in the, uh, as a poetic uh, you know, trope of, of uh, Schwitter's whole entire work, I'd like to, to, you know, to explain a little more about that. Sure, I, 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 um, that's good to draw that, that connection between what I'm saying about the, the central, let me see if I can flip through my book and find that, um, between the central spread of his yeah. Tipo Reclama issue there, where I talk about that as ink and ink, uh, ink as ink, as you say, and then uh, some of his exile works such as this with algae. Um, and I, I think what I would say to distinguish those two is that in a way they're um, sort of inversions of one another. So in the second chapter, what I'm interested in there is Schwitter's work with language. Uh, language again, you know, written text in his collages, in his design work. Um, and Schwitter's interest in <clears throat> trying to reach some sort of degree zero, zero, where the materiality of language and the thing signified sort of is, is merged. Uh, uh, so a sort of language is pure presentation of the thing in itself. And so there, when I look at that central spread of the Tipo Reclama issue, what I'm, what I'm trying to sort of say is that he's thinking about writing there, he's thinking about written words, but he's, he's representing ink through ink. And so he sort of, it, 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 he's thinking about language there, but it's language where ink doesn't, isn't I-N-K or T-I-N-T-E as it would be in German, Tinta, but rather it is ink as the thing in itself. So he's thinking through language, through that separation of thing and sign in language to try to realize some kind of uh, merging again of thing and sign in that central spread. And I should say, I don't know how you like that reading, Ivan, but this was something um, 
that for me, when I was writing this book, one of the things I really wanted to, to do was to sort of dig in and speculatively and sort of um, deeply read individual images. And so when I began to look at that Tipo Reclama issue, particularly that central spread, uh, and open it up and begin to think about it as, as an image that one can read, that one can see things going on. It was very enjoyable for me, and I hope it's enjoyable for the reader to sort of see oh, that un unpack. It's a, very strong, it's a very strong moment in your book, that reading of that reclame. And I want to make a little aside, which is a kind of funny one. It's a, you know, so you, um, Schwitter thought that it would bring, you know, it's a special issue of his, uh, his journal, Mertz, and entirely, uh, made a for basically project of advertisement that he was not asked to, to do for this company, which uh, didn't like it. And, and he got attacked uh, in the press for having done something so awful. And by a critic who, who produces a, a caricature of the, of the, and you, of the, this uh, design, which you show. And, but this critic doesn't seem to have existed. And you make an hypothesis that maybe it was Schwitters himself who wrote the attack <laughs> and made the caricature, which I think would be absolutely wonderful. But, uh... So I, I did look today because we talked and I did find some other things by this H.H. H. Lenhart. Oh. But yes. that's still, I think that last page could have, I and mean, he clearly was, whoever he was, was connected to Hanover. So, I mean, <clears throat> again, that page is such a perfect sort of anti Schwitters. Uh, design. But let me get back to your question. And I wanted to speak now to the final chapter about exile. And I think there, again, as I said, there's sort of inversions of one another. My reading of, of the Tipo Reclama spread and these later exile works were there. My point is that Schwitters is focused on things as they are. So for instance, in this image, again, he's pinning algae to the center of the image. It's, uh, you know, Mertz build mit algen, so it's Mertz picture with algae. It's sort of presentational in a way his earlier Mertz work wasn't. But what I'm interested in there again is that he's doing this within the frame of the image. Yeah. And so the thing again is in itself, it's a presentation of itself. And so it becomes sort of this moment of self alienation of the thing rather than pure presentation of the thing. And, and so I read that then through uh, Schwitter's passport concerns and the idea of the passport is si similarly something that is a sort of presentation of the subject that is also this alienation of the subject, particularly in the context in which Schwitter's was, uh, was, was, was working and struggling to get his own passport in order. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that make sense to you, Ivalon? Yes, yeah, yes, he did. He did. Oh, um, on, the, on the passport, I was thinking that uh, Maybe uh, this it was a little long this passage, and I thought maybe it was a little metaphoric, which you you didn't didn't want to do metaphors. So I thought, mm, maybe I would have to uh -oh. would have. <laughs> but uh, speaking about this kind of you know fuzzy concept, I was wondering because you explained that when you know so there was this big conflict between Dada Berlin Dada and Der Sturm, the which was a gallery of Gerhard Walden, uh, who was basically the the temple for expressionism. And Walden was very, very apolitical. And the funny thing is that he ended up uh, exiling to Russia and dying there, but that's another story, which I didn't know. I just like totally, yeah. but anyway, so it was basically the art as art and expression and all that. And uh, on one side and let's do the revolution and no art whatsoever on the other side. And Schwitters uh, understood as being part of the Sturm was criticized by the Berlin Dada for that. You show that for Schwitters, the, the term revolution, uh, Mr. Cat, please. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stand that. I'm doing that. Sorry. Uh, you, you show that in the mind of Schwitters, the, the rhetoric of Der Sturm, which had a lot, a lot to do with circles and, and, and you know, orbit and, and, you know, sort of cosmic. Uh, revolution in the sense of, you know, in, in the, the stars and, and whatsoever. And the political revolution for Schwitters, it just clicked for him, it was the same. So, or he, he played as if it was, this, if it was the same. So there's a kind of strange nominalism here in, in, uh, in Schwitters' um, uh, way of thinking. And um, 
I was just amazed because it seems to contradict the notion of language as material. You know, it's a, it's it's like the name uh, as opposed to the thing in many ways. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, in that case, my thinking in the second chapter about the specificities of language, and in that first chapter where I talk about his interest in uh, in revolution and sort of these homologies between the way Der Sturm talked about rotation and cosmic revolution, etc., and the way Dada did it. To me, those are two separate um, separate things. I mean, I think he's thinking about sort of the way that revolution, simply as a trope, as a um, as a, as a concept, is circulating across really these two groups who are you know, really at loggerheads, but where he is squarely between them. <clears throat> and I hope that's something that, that I effectively argue in that first chapter, that really Schwitters was very, very connected to the Dadas, and he was looking very directly yeah, at their should, work, even should. as he was clearly completely indebted to, to Walden and was beholden to, you know, the aesthetic program of, of Der Storm. Yeah, you, and you, that, you see even and, some case in which the description of works of works that are not made yet uh, match completely the works that Schwitters is going to, to do. So description by the Berlin Dada, by Ulsenbeck and people like that. So yeah, they, and there's one spread there, Ivan, and I, I hope you took a look and were uh, found it convincing. Let me just find this, uh, which is this one. Uh, yes, yes, yes. No, I, Gross, yes. a work that he would have seen in one of his earlier assemblages where, and this is again a, a case of sort of close reading where I was excited because nobody's made this connection before. Say, look at this work, Schwitters is looking very, very early, very directly to what Grosch is doing. Yes. So even as he's exhibiting with Walden, even as he's publishing in Der Storm, and Der Storm is repeatedly publishing uh, things at that moment, 1918, 1919, you know, art has nothing to do with revolution. The artists who are saying that are, you know, the biggest egomaniacs, he's looking directly to those Dada artists who, who are saying mm -hmm. that. So for me, again, the play with revolution was less a thinking specifically about language than a sort of, as you say, something that, that I argue uh, clicked for him as something where he could begin to mine some connecting ground between the two. And I think this encounter with Picabia that I spend a few pages on was, yeah. was important in that. <clears throat> yeah, I, I was not entirely, that's one thing, I was not entirely convinced that it was necessary for him, but you know, I'm not, you know, I mean, overdetermination is, uh, I'm never opposed to, so one more. Okay. <laughs> I mean, for me, the thing also that then becomes, um, uh, so, you know, helps me to, to feel confident in that is his inclusion of that gear at the center of uh, das Merzbild that I illustrate, where it seems to have come directly from that Picabia, which he would have seen. You know, he, he received those yeah. from Tsara. Yeah. May, he, May 1919, he writes to Tsara, the first uh, Merz show opens uh, July. I always get confused, June, July, July. So it's right at that moment where he's working through these things. Um, now, I want to talk about something else in, in your book, which is a really interesting um, and very new to me discussion of the Merzbau. I mean, I've read, you know, many things on the Merzbau, but I, um, I, it never occurred to me uh, to think of, of it in relation to, in the way you describe relation to, photo to photography and to basically the Merzbau itself being like a camera and all that. One of the things that really struck me because of that were two things. First is the way in which you relate the Merzbau to the exhibitions in Hanover, uh, the first exhibition by, by Dorner on um, facsimile and art. <clears throat> and so reproduction, reproductibility, a complete Walter Benjamin uh, argument, which of course we, we don't know yet. We don't, we don't know if Benjamin looked at this, this exhibition, but you would have heard about it. And a second 
is in the same context is the the the, the project by Donner and and Molinage of this uh, room for to, for today or something. Yeah, this, Raum des Gegenwart. Yeah. And uh, I never thought of the Mersbahn connection to the Moli, and I never and, and if I had thought about it, I would not have thought about it as against, as opposed. But you show very clearly that. For Schwitters, the I mean the, the really the really query dimension of the Merzbau is uh, is very uh, forcefully uh, uh, you know exposed and and including things which I really I didn't remember if I knew it that in, in the Merzbau in one of the grottoes as Schwitters spoke of these little enclaves which were basically almost invisible because they were sometimes inside the walls and whatever the, con contain uh, the the desk cast of his uh, uh, infant son who died you know, very young. I mean, it is really quite a st striking. One thing which I would like to know a little more, you make allusion several times to the traces of visitors in the Mesba, what they would have left. What, like, what would they have left? Uh, dirt? I mean, that is what, is it, is it discussed in, the, in by Schwitters, uh, the trace of visitors or? Yeah, so, this is, um, you know, the, the complicated thing with the Matzbau again is that so many of our accounts of it are not of the Matzbau, but of these earlier columns that, as we were discussing earlier, Gwendolyn Webster has really clearly shown our product of the 20s, but the Matzbau as such came to exist really 1930, 31, and was a product of these years, um, as I invoked earlier, sort of of, of, of a... Um, uh, you know, what what you could describe as Schwitter's, the onset of exile for Schwitter's while he's still in Germany, as he mm -hmm. sees sort of the world collapsing outside his windows. So what happens then is uh, in the early 30s, he has workmen come in, he sort of covers over this ragtag collection of, uh, of items, photographs that he's collected. He includes things as well that are still visible. He puts in panes of glass, so on and so forth. Um, and so this is this moment I'm talking about where I discuss it through the lens of photography and photographic debates at the time. And in terms of what sort of people who passed through would have left behind, you know, in terms of the specifics at that point, I'm actually not 100% sure. We don't really have many specific accounts at that time. So what I'm sort of arguing there is that there would have still been those continued kind of left traces that we have from those earlier, in those earlier that. columns that he would have put in. And then also, you know, I call attention to the fact that now we have these new whitewashed walls. So I think just scuffing, just smears. And also I invoke there uh, in that chapter at a certain point, he talks about, you know, I'm here, forget who he's writing to. He says, you know, I'm here in this uh, uh, in this space in the Merit's Bow, and I, it's cold, but I'm heating it with my own body heat. So this idea of sort of bodily traces, be it visible or not, just in terms of sort of, you know, the, the, the air, the sweat, the, the heat that a body has produced that has sort of filled that, that, that space. Um, now, you, sh you show in, in many ways that the Merit's Bow for him were also, I mean, even though it was a reliquary and and it has a lot of, um, a lot of, you know, <clears throat> same function as a reliquary for him. But you also say it's a kind of refuge. So, would you say that the Merzbau is a kind of escapist, uh, um, you know, um, value and or function um, in in the, in, the, in the view of what you know, the group because it's. What you showed that it's the Mesba basically evolves and, and you know they like several several phases. There's the very beginning, which which comes out from these columns, and then in 1933 he considered it is finished, and then when it's photographed, and then it continues nevertheless until 37. So it's it it really evolves throughout the, the, the rise of of uh, you know Nazism, and so because of, of the, because it's an interior because it's a kind of uh, you know a house in itself uh, that contains and uh, I was wondering you know there's a kind of like dimension of the cocoon or you know, is, is that a, uh, you know proper way of thinking yeah that's a good question and that's something that um, you know as I worked on that chapter specifically my wording sort of I struggled with because I don't think it was a refuge. That's part of it, obviously. It's a kind of 
you know, it is a kind of cocooning, a kind of encasing. But the thing about the Mats Bow as well is that, again, it was constantly in construction and deconstruction was a constant state of mutation. Uh, um, you know, elements of it were movable. You could inhabit it. You could move elements around. He's shifting the pieces around. And I, I guess also what I what I want to argue there by calling attention not to the display of objects as such, but to the space itself as a kind of image space, a photographic image space as I describe it, that it isn't simply a kind of scrapbook. It isn't simply a kind of collection of artifacts of the past, but it's a sort of generative and conceptualized meeting of past and present. And mm -hmm. in that, I see it as something that's different. And I end with this discussion of Benjamin and mimicry at the end of that chapter, yeah. or Benjamin and mimesis, that it's something that is sort of looking to the past as a kind of generative material. Mm -hmm. But it's not, you know, if you think of the Maritzbau and you look at those pictures, you think about I'm just it's not a kind of surrounding with this sort of overloaded artifacts of the past. It is the past sort of materialized, but the past materialized for sort of passing through for a present day activation mm -hmm. is what I'm trying to argue there. Um, and I think that's also then why it continues, you know, why he then insistent, uh, insistently is, is working on these new Matzbau constructions simultaneously, but then after he leaves Germany for good. It's this link between past and present that is not just a looking back, it's a looking back and a sort of uh, regeneration of the past in the present as something that is animate rather than just uh, uh, affixed and, uh, uh, and sort of surrounding one. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, yes. Now another, to come back to something of the other chapters and, you know, I, I like to, to link you know, different chapters. The, so you, it, it becomes clear in the, the last chapter on, on the ex exile works, that where, where it becomes clearer and you basically say, say that it becomes clearer dialectically that the, the early work, the Merz work has in fact uh, what you call an exilic uh, aesthetics where works are brought in, but feel, you know, displaced and all that. While the exile work is against the exilic aesthetic. So it's a quite, very interesting paradox. And, and, you know, I would like you to expand on it for. Sure. So I hope, you know, as I hear you describe it, I hope as you read, you didn't feel I'm being too tricky by, by half. But, you know, what, what I argue there, you know, that chapter started and I should say, you know, this book, I end by talking about the Manil collection and these two exhibitions uh, where Schwitters was present, the Manil collection. And when I first began thinking about Schwitters, there was this retrospective uh, at the Manil that was up for four or five months. I think uh, it, came to, it came to Princeton, I think that's the same. Exactly. It was at Princeton and at Berkeley. Um, organized by Isabel Schultz from the Schwitters Foundation and Joseph Helfenstein, who was at the Manil. But I bring that up because one of the things that was just great about that was to have a hundred plus Schwitters works up around the corner for months was sort of the perfect uh, uh, ground in which to begin thinking about a project. And one of the things that came out of that, I can remember going through those galleries is sort of wanting to figure out the, the, the later work is different. Um, and it, to me, it was less satisfying, but I wanted to sort of get a grasp on, okay, what, what is different here? And so that is sort of, you know, what I'm trying to do in that last chapter is think about, okay, the work shifts at about this time. And that's one of the things I say there again, it doesn't really shift in 1937. It shifts already around 1930, 31. And I think that's significant for sort of what Schwitter's <clears throat> going through, how he's thinking about his own situation and about his art. But what I articulate there and the chap that that chapter is a little bit different than the others and that it's less sort of focusing on one work or a small set of works than trying to look at a larger 
body and set set some patterns well, you there. Still do, do pretty close analysis of the several works. I mean, you know, yeah. yeah, but but what I wanted to say is so, you know, what I came to realize is what we discussed earlier, this kind of presentational aesthetic that this that early merits as I as I argue throughout the book, but I come back to in that last chapter is fundamentally rooted again in this problem of eigengift we were discussing earlier that you have objects from outside that come in and are never properly at home fully at home and Schwitters calls attention to this over and over they're never fully at home within the space of of the image they still belong over there and that shifts in his later work in his later work you have things like that algae I showed you earlier it's just pinned there as algae and it's called Merritt's picture with algae and so for me, that began, I, I began to think of this through, again, the lens of Schwitter's own experience as this kind of locating, this placing, this fixing of objects within a frame, within a home that they, where, where they are sort of stable and they are what they are. But as we discussed earlier, they're not. They become sort of representations of themselves. They become sort of self-alienated objects. Um, and so what then, as I was thinking through that, it made me rethink the earlier work. And this was, again, one of these moments where um, working through a certain body of images all of a sudden shone a new light on another set of works. And so that's where then I realized that this, this late work is, in a way, a kind of reversal of that exilic aesthetics, as you said, of early merits, where, again, it's foundationally about objects that cross a border and are never at home on either side. And I realized as I was thinking about Schwitters in exile, well, wait, this is the structure of exile, actually. And that is the structure of sort of, uh, of early merits and, and merits throughout, but it begins to wither, begins to be sort of set against this, this aesthetic of placing, of locating, of putting at home in the later works. And of course, that emerges also out of um, the Merit's Bow, as we were discussing earlier, which also is sort of uh, uh, an object that is, uh, um, or, or not an object, an installation that is fraught between ideas of at-homeness, it's literally built in Schwitter's home, it is this kind of cocoon, but also of uh, a sort of at, ho at home that is not at home. So does that? <laughs> yes, yes, no, it's a, uh, it's a, um... <clears throat> a, uh, looking at all the questions which I, I could, uh, I could um, ask you. Um, I had a question, but you, I was listening to what you said. I answered it for you. Yeah, just, no, no, it just, uh, it just um, passed by. Well, I mean, let me also say, if I can, even on going back to your opening question about politics, you know, one of the things again about working on this book and focusing on sort of these specific moments, these specific problems in Schwitter's career is that time and again, uh, as you can hear and as we were discussing, fundamental political issues come bubbling up. So in exile, obviously, um, you know, passports, the <laughs> genocidal politics that were leading him to go into exile. And you can see that, uh, I argue, in sort of the specific avenues that his, or the specific channels that his art uh, goes through. Also in the Meritzbau, less so in, I think the second chapter where I'm talking about the, the design work. Although there also, that's a moment of course, where the German economy is strong, 23, 24. Um, and so it's sort of this brief uh, respite uh, within this broader um, history I'm covering. But then also in that final chapter, on the precarious, one of my goals, again, was to place politics front and center yeah. and to connect Schwitter's art to our present moment and to political challenges you of our own a couple of times in, you know, in, so It happens earlier in the book because uh, very early in the book, there's an illusion of Black Lives Matter, I think. You know, it's yeah. Like, uh, early in, earlier in the book. So we, and, I, I, didn't see, and you very early on in the book, very, uh, the very big, no, like page 20 or so, you, you, you quote uh, Urshorn that says, I, I don't want to do political art, I want to do art politically. So already you know that it's, that you are writing, you're a good historian, uh, that you're writing from the present <laughs> rather than uh, trying to imagine the past uh, as it was. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so that is something that's very pres 
you know, that percolates throughout the book, this the relationship to the way you, you see the relationship to politics, including to the present. But I still want to come back to this, to this, uh, to the exile work as being a reversal. And precisely because he's in exile, he's doing works that are looking towards or looking forward to creation of a unity. Uh, he wants to, you know, the, and you point out to several things, the figures are centered. Uh, there's also landscapes, uh, you mean, the, you know, the figuration, there's uh, biographic, uh, biomorphic uh, figures in, that are very centered. The figures do not at all participate in this kind of uh, build up of the surface is a kind of very complex play of transparency and all this kind of, all that that's from the early work. No, it's it's very the 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 support becomes neutral. You even you even make allu uh, allusion to to Albert the Alberti uh, uh, pane of window, and and also to the tabletop, which is a little different because I would the tabletop you could think of uh, uh, Leo Steinberg's uh, um, uh, what's it called. Uh, yeah, a flatbed. So that you don't you don't go there. I don't know why. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, the work that you construct, the work that Schwitters do in exile, as striving towards a, a formal unity, as opposed to the complexity of the Merth's work. And so there's a kind of um, once again, you just wonder. You know, was it the, the horribleness of what he was living through uh, drove him to produce this work, which has always felt very different indeed. I mean, I'm not, you're not the first one to point that they are very, very different from what he was doing before. But since you saw the, the language of exile being at the core of the Mertz uh, foundational work from 1919, uh, would I mean? I'm just trying to say is, is suddenly uh, Schwitters, you know, uh, coming in, coming in, or you know, or whatever, um, or abandoning is you know, disruptive yeah. potential. Um, so I, I wouldn't say he's caving in. I mean, one thing is I, 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 I hope I don't talk a language of unity in that in that chapter. I don't. It, it's less, I guess, unity that I'm concerned with than a kind of, I talk about figuration, a kind of figurative impulse okay. and a kind of placing. You say you need uh, it somewhere. I'm, okay, well. You do. <laughs> I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll do a, a word search. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, there's a few things. One, of course, Schwitters in those years also is, he's painting figuratively, he, uh, you know, just the historical conditions in which he's working in exile, uh, you know, with a need for income, he's selling, he's, he's doing portraits on commission, he's selling landscapes to uh, tourists in Norway. Uh, he doesn't have a kind of avant-garde uh, audience for the earlier work that he's doing. So it's partly just under duress. But then also, you know, what I, what I try to argue is that I think also there's just an urge on his part. There's, there, he begins working in this way, partly because he sort of wants for himself to have some kind of sense of, I'm in place, this is a, there's a coherence to who I am and to where I am. And there isn't for him, right? I talk about how he's both criticized, you're too German, you're not German enough, uh, or you're too, you're too German and you're anti-German because you're in the degenerate art show. Um, and that his work at that point, in whatever, way and for whatever reason becomes sort of permeated by that uh, by that desire and you see it in the work and not all the work as i stress you know i leave out a lot there but it becomes a kind of through line that is not present uh, mm -hmm. earlier and i think that the work that he was producing in the early 20s um what do i want to say it 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 um it, it um, you know, as, as I sort of articulate and as I came to understand the logic of those late years, it just doesn't fit in in the way that it did, that mm -hmm. it did earlier. Um, and, you know, and, and I, I 
as we as we mentioned earlier, I sort of try to connect that to this discourse of the passport, which interestingly for me also the passport as we know it came into existence at that same moment that Merz came into existence. And then at the end of his career it becomes this fundamental concern for Schwitters at this moment when his art, you know, is taking on this, this new uh, uh, <clears throat> kind of look. Now there's a, um, something that I was surprised that you don't go into um, because I would have thought that um, for some reason that it, that would be part of your discussion with the, all the late work of Schwitters have, when people have written about it, which is not that, not, not many, the, 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 the post 37, exhibit a kind of almost deliberate badness, you know, like lack of craft or, you know, it's like crude and, you know, it's like he's like, um, like early uh, Schnabel, you know, I want to do bad art. Uh, and you don't, you don't mention this aspect at all. So I was surprised and maybe, maybe you, you yeah, I mean, I, I, what would I say? I think that I'm, I, I'm sort of critical of the work. I say very forthrightly, this work that I'm discussing is less interesting for me. Um, I guess I don't think I ever qualitatively say, okay, this is bad art, like you're describing. I think that there is a, uh, you know, if you oh, I think it's, I don't think writing, it's bad art. I don't think it's bad art. I think it is deliberately made to look like bad art. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I um, what do I want to say? I, yeah, the deliberateness of it, I don't talk about. I think that it's on Schwitter's mind. I think that he is, um, you know, when he writes letters to friends saying, I don't have an audience here for the work that I want to do. And, you know, he's, he's, he's also, you know, writing things where he's clearly sort of um, reflecting on his frustrations about the work that he's producing, about his ability to produce the work that he wants to uh, produce. You're right, though, in terms of a deliberateness of badness in that work. I don't dig into it. I, and I don't know if I'm ready to say that there's a deliberateness to it. Um, I mean, my discussion of motivation. Someone, someone, sorry, yeah. yeah. For, for someone who is so sophisticated, you know, to do things so crudely, frankly, it must, it's, it's already must be very hard for him to do something so bad. Yeah. I mean, also, what I always admire the work because of that, actually. I, I, I like this late, late work. I'm not like you. But, but I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I always like this this late work, but uh, but for for reasons, uh, I, because I think it's a kind of like, you know, uh, the, just the finger. You want art? Yeah, I'll give you art. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, also one thing that is interesting there that I that I mention I don't dig into that much is, and this is something that became clear to me again at the Manil show, looking at the galleries with with later works, is there's much more use coming back to language of snippets of text of journals and so forth as proto captions, mm -hmm. you know, again, in a way that you just don't see in the earlier works. I mean, clearly he's aware of the textual elements he's working with earlier. Um, and that is something that, that, you know, again, becomes part of what I describe as a kind of quasi figurative impulse at that, at that mm -hmm. point. I, I would like, uh, because just to give the, People, some idea of the book you, for you to read the last paragraph you know, of, of the, the book from just as Urshorn. You know, so okay. 301. Okay. Should I do it dramatically? Yeah, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is the final paragraph of the book um, where I've been discussing Schwitters and, and, uh, and Thomas Urshorn. And I start again by talking about the 2010 retrospective and then also this 2015 show that David Breslin put up at the Manil, not just on Schwitters, but on collage broadly understood through the idea of precariousness. So I'll read this as Ivalan. I, I have to do it, Ivalan's uh, asking me, so I, uh, I'm happy to do this. Just as Hirshhorn sought to fuse was and is in his Hanover project, and this is a recreation or a kind of installation at the side of the Meritzbau that Hirshhorn built. And as Schwitters created new objects built from the remnants of past experience, so I've aimed to animate Meritz for the present 
by paying renewed attention to the specific political and semiotic condition, conditions in which it emerged, from the revolutionary cauldron of post-war Berlin to the exigencies of war and exile. Built as it is from simple rubbish, Merz asserts the material fact of these conditions, the obdurate stuff of the life world from which it comes, with unambiguous directness. But in this very positing of sundry historical detritus as the stuff of art, Merit simultaneously generates an operational potency in and for the present. Its toxins, in short, linger. Looking seriously at Merit's today accordingly means testing this threat and actuating its efficacy. Working through and putting to use Merz's making precarious of established structures of representation and valuation, learning from its orchestrated entwinement of past and present, art and trash and politics and aesthetics, extending and deepening its interrogation of identificatory apparatuses and processes, and taking up its ongoing grappling with the historical force of art. We can only hope as these lines are written amid news of democracy's ongoing degradation and a pandemic's continued deadly spread that attempts to renew Schwitter's efforts for the present face a brighter future than Merit's as it took shape a century ago had before it. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> so, so the thing for me when I wrote that, that's exactly a hundred years ago, essentially when Merit's came to be, yeah. 1919 and I wrote you know I wrote that I don't know months and months ago and of course the worry was that by the time the book comes out that final reference to pandemics deadly spread and dem democratic degradation would be old news unfortunately <laughs> it's uh very uh current for the yeah yes it is uh should we do I mean do we have time for questions or I don't know should we wrap up or if there's any questions, we could take one. Well, I, I perhaps have one question for you, um, Graham, uh, just to extend the conversation past 1948 and past Schwitter's death. I was wondering about what, if you could give us a sense of the reception of his work in the US. Um, it's kind of ironic that he never uh, managed to come here, even though I think he applied several times for a visa um and but his reception seems to have been very important here and i think i read somewhere that the museum of modern art was supporting his efforts to rebuild Merzbau. so how what is the story of both during his lifetime and after his lifetime the, the, his legacy in, in so in America? yeah he was in direct correspondence with alfred barr um he you know was asked can i build a Merzbau at uh, you know at the museum of modern art um, I forget the specifics of that because I haven't thought about it in so long, but it looks like it came very close to happening, but it did never come to fruition, obviously. Um, and then after the war, you know, as you mentioned, Rauschenberg and Bruce Connor and others, um, you know, Schwitters then, uh, so he, he died in 1948, as I believe he was just about to get UK citizenship. I mean, literally within days. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and then he was, uh, you know, in uh, Dada and Surrealism. Uh, what's, the, what's the name of the show, Ivalan, that was up? Yeah, Dada and Surrealism. Dada and Surrealism, yeah. Uh, he had a number of works there. And he, you know, with this sort of moment of um, uh, sort of proto-pop and then pop, he was sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the late 50s, uh, sort of became central, obviously, for Rauschenberg and others. Oddly, though, there's really been very few major museum, you know, exhibitions of Schwitter. So again, there was uh, the Museum of Mod Modern Art exhibition in 1980, where there's the, the great John Elderfield uh, book. But then the next one was, was, uh, 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 was that that was organized by the Manila, which is, you know, totally striking to me uh, and yeah. completely fortuitous for me that that show happened to be up when I began to think about, about the work. But so mm -hmm. Schwitter's then, again, with this sort of rediscovery, uh, or not rediscovery, but sort of, uh, 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 you know, attachment of artists in the Rauschenberg and others in the late 50s into the 60s, really became fundamental 
uh, for that generation and, uh, 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 and sort of was almost more popular in the United States or more important in the United States than back in Germany for many years at that point. Mm-hmm. We should mention uh, that uh, there's a kind of Schwitter's buzz because Schwitter's, uh, a collection of Schwitter's writings just appeared as well. Yeah, uh, exactly. Translated by Tim Grundy and, and edited by Megan Luke. It just appeared, I forgot who is the publisher, but it's, uh, it's a Chicago, kind of yeah. Chicago University Press. It's a pretty big book and quite, quite right. extraordinary, actually. Yeah. Well, we, we have to leave it there, unfortunately, but thank you so much both uh, for this wonderful discussion. Um, so if you'd like to purchase this uh, book, please, uh, you can visit us to, uh, you can come and visit us at the bookstore in Chelsea. We're open every day from 11 to 7. Um, you can also send us an email and we'll send it to you. And you can also order it from our bookshop page, which should be uh, right below the screen. Um, this event um, was recorded. And if you'd like to view it again, or if you want to share it with everyone, with anyone, Um, we'll post it in just a minute. It'll be on uh, Paula Cooper Gallery's PCG Studio page. Um, and our next event uh, will be a conversation between Edmund White and Bill Goldstein about Edmund White's new novel, A Previous Life, uh, which is coming out next week from Bloomsbury Publishing. And that conversation will take place on Tuesday, January 25th. Uh, next week at 7 p.m. So please uh, join us. And until then, happy reading and good night.